Hi, I'm Li Shang. I'm a professor in the Department of Computer Science in NUS. And today I'll just give you a quick run through of what my research group does. Um, in a nutshell, we design new hardware that runs software. And so my recent research direction has been looking to how we design new hardware chips that will power um, future wearables and how that could enable new software applications. So when you think of wearables, the first thing that comes to mind is probably the pervasive um, smartwatches that are everywhere nowadays. Now this is the Samsung um, Galaxy smartwatch. And if you open it up and tear down and take a look at the chips inside, you'll see many chips. The smaller ones are essentially the sensors, um, like motion sensors, temperature sensors, as well as the networking chips. But the largest chip um, invariably is the compute chip that runs the software. So that here is that red box in there. And this compute chip um, was fabricated in 10 nanometer process, which at a very high level means that the transistors of the chip are about 10 nanometer apart. And so it's a very sophisticated process where you could squeeze many transistors into this tiny chip size. And it has um, the architecture of this processor chip. It has two um, computer CPU cores that runs the OS and the general applications. And it also has the Mali um, GPU, which is the graphics processing unit that runs the graphics and the image processing. Now, if we think back to what kind of chips are similar to this, it kind of resembles that of smartphones from about 10 years ago. Okay, so the smartphone from 10 years ago, here there's a Samsung Galaxy S2 phone from 2011. The chip in there was fabricated in an older process, so 45 nanometer process, where you, the transistors are further apart and you could squeeze fewer transistors on the same area. Well, the architecture then is about similar. It has two um, CPU cores as well, running at about one point something gigahertz, and it has a graphics processing unit, a GPU. So, but even then, the processor chip from 10 years ago is still more powerful than what we have in today's latest um, smartwatches. And so for instance, they have basically more complex cores and more um, GPU cores. And the reason is very simple, is because the battery of a phone can fit a much larger form factor than what you could fit on a tiny watch. And so the battery life of this old phone from 10 years ago is still about four times higher than that of the latest smartwatches. So if we try to sort of um, forecast what future wearable chips will look like, right? We have to first think about what future wearable software will run. What kind of software will run on future watches and so on. And perhaps you know, today, if we look at the wearables we have, the software is fairly simple. All it does is count your steps, you know, it's the more advanced ones, count how long you sleep, that's about it. But the form, maybe what we can do is to first, first of all, to look at what we can do in very advanced uh, phones today, because the smartwatches are kind of constrained by what kind of hardware you have today. And so if we look at phone applications that are more sophisticated and could be realized and are highly mobile moving around with us, maybe that will give us a sense for what future wearable applications will look like. So here I'm going to sort of just highlight one particular application uh, we looked at on phones um, several years back when I was still at MIT. And this was basically looking at how we could use software running on phones to enable driverless vehicles. Now, if in, when you come to NUS, you will see driverless vehicles going around being tested. And this is one of the driverless vehicles that was run by the Singapore MIT Research Center here. But what they use is very expensive and clunky um, LiDAR chips, um, such as those big ones up there. Um, you see they have three of these um, around the vehicles. And the purpose of these LiDAR chips is to basically detect how far away obstacles are. So the cars, the trees, the roadside, etc. So the research question we had was, well, if we could build new chips, can we actually have phones that could enable such LiDAR? And so the effective function of LiDAR is that it shoots a laser out and then by the time it hits the environment, be it a tree or a car and a bounce back, that round trip time you calculate and that gives you a sense for how far away that thing is. And so what we did was to repurpose our smartphones and this was a very old smartphone, the, Google, the Nexus um, phone from 2014. And we added 
a very cheap laser. It's a $10 laser. So that's this over there that we bought online from Taobao actually. And so that shoots lasers out um, controlled by a microcontroller. And then everything else is done in software, essentially on the phone, through the camera. So we shoot laser, we know when it's shooting. Then the camera tries to find the red line of the laser and it detects how long it took from when you pounce to when it come back and that gives you an estimate of the distance. And so here we have a phone that would work as a software LiDAR and that would improve as you have better and better phones along the way. And the, the use case, as you could imagine, going on a set way, such as this scooter right here, going to work. And then as you get off, you tell the set way, you know, go get a cup of coffee for me and it'll drive by itself to Starbucks, grab a coffee and back for you. Now, if you look at that application, well, it is a very challenging application for the chips that run on it because it needs to be very real time. It needs to run very fast and it all needs to run on the device because there's no time to send through the wireless to the cloud and back. And definitely there's no power left to do that because the power to send wireless is very high. And so maybe you think, so what kind of chips could power that kind of wearables in the future? What if we could realize that on our watches? So we, and it could do all kinds of these sophisticated processes. Well, perhaps it would look like since um, today's wearables chips looks like 10 years ago phones, maybe tomorrow's you know, 2030 wearable chips will just look like today's phones. So let's take a look at today's phones chips. So this is from the Apple XS. Inside is a very sophisticated chip that is on one of the most leading edge processors today, seven nanometer, so even more squeezer. And in there, they have six cores of a processor, six core CPU, a four core GPU, and an eight core NPU, which is the one that runs the AI. So more and more cores all squeeze on the same tiny little chip. So will that be what happens in future wearable chips? So can future watches just have this, you know, many more cores on CPUs, GPUs, plus these NPUs for AI? Well, the short answer is no. And the reason is because of Moore's law. So all of you have, may have heard of Moore's law, which is that the number of transistors on the chip was doubling in the past every one and a half years or so. So, but that cannot continue um, simply because of physics. So we can't, we are facing huge difficulties squeezing more and more transistors on the same area. And this is first felt by wearables because in wearables, you can't even increase the size of of the area, of the chip area. You're constrained by the form factor, in this case, the watch face. You're constrained by power, etc. And so what that means is that the number of transistors you have to play with to build a chip is pretty much not going to scale that much as we grow. And so what that says is that the hardware has to be designed such that we, we reuse these pressures and transistors very well. So we have to make these transistors configurable so that you don't waste any transistors and you keep re reusing all the transistors that you have on the chip for different purposes to run different software. And to make it very high performance per watt so that because you have such limited battery, this hardware will have to be highly parallel and very simple. And what this means is that the hardware will have to be simple, parallel and configurable, so as simple as you can, and then yet you have to run very sophisticated software, like we said, something like, like the software LiDAR. What it means is that a lot of it, the magic has to happen in software. The software has to configure these hardware very well and then run them very fast and at low power. And so I'll just very quickly show um, this one particular chip that we have built. Um, is if you maybe you're familiar with FPGAs, um, which are kind of configurable chips that you could buy today from Xilinx, etc. Well, but what we've designed is what's called CGRA. So unlike a FPGA that does it at bitwise configuration, this does it at wordwise. And, and so it has coarser grain um, reconfigurability, which gives you the power, but yet you could still reconfigure it and deliver kind of good performance. And so this was one of the first chips I fabricated from NUS and it works. And um, you can see that it actually could run actually a pretty good performance um, speed up at only 100 milliwatts. And we're now working with um, GovTech and, and the government as well as to see how we could actually use this to accelerate um, new wearable applications for IoTs. Now, if you have chips like that, and, and we're designing many other chips, um, that could actually do a lot more compute on a tiny little watch 
then what could we actually realize? Well, besides, unlike phones though, these wearables are even cooler because they're directly worn on us. So that spawned us to think about whether we could do actually fancy molecular mo monitoring on these electronics chips. And so PH Watch is one particular um, um, first uh, sensor that we built. And what we did was to basically hit on um, the pulse oximeters on smartwatches. So many of your smartwatches and phones today have pulse oximeters, which basically measure your heart rate. So it measures, um, so it sends a, a, a light into your, through your skin. And then depending on how it bounces back, it actually detects the red um, amount of red cells in there. And that gives you a sense and the software that figures out the heart rate and all. So what we did was, well, what if we add a pH sensor? So this is a sensor that was fabricated in collaboration with my collaborators at Biomedical Engineering. And that sensor actually will change color when it comes into contact with our sweat. So now we can use the same hardware, which is the pulse oximeter, to basically detect sweat and the pH level of sweat. So it does the molecular sensing of your sweat in real time in software. And so this is what we coupled with um, and were able to show that you could detect pH at a good accuracy. And we also added um, the high cube acceleration chip in there so that we could actually run this in real time and show how it could actually function, compute and sensing together to, for delivering next generation wearables. And well, well, INF, is, is, if you're interested in looking at interdisciplinary um, from hardware to software, working with applications and material science um, and, and wearables, come join my group. Because we are, we, I think the future of wearables will be very exciting because it will go way beyond just counting our steps. Um, you, you are already going to be seeing augmented glasses, um, augmented earbuds. Um, you will see wearables that could detect your intent, what you're thinking. Wearables that could sense your molecules and your health, just like PH Watch. Uh, wearables that could actually function like artificial skin detect your emotions and so on. And all these could only work if we could design new novel hardware and software chips that could build into full systems. Thank you.